In children and adolescents, the risk of death from SARS-CoV-2 infection is 0.005%. Right, we're beginning with an excerpt from an article published in the British Medical Journal. And the article is in basically weighing the benefits, or I should say the risk versus the benefit of vaccinating children against COVID-19. And this gives a wonderful, wonderful attempt at a balanced argument in regard to whether children should be vaccinated against COVID-19 itself. Now, let me, let me continue reading first, and then I'll go to the top of the article, and then we'll go into our data analytics. All right. In children and adolescents, the risk of death from SARS-CoV-2 infection is 0.005%. And those who are hospitalized with COVID-19, it is 0% to 0.7%. Now, here is an interesting aspect. However, again, these numbers often include children who died with a SARS-CoV-2 infection and not because of it. A recent population-based study showed that only 41% of children, now keep in mind, every life is, life is precious. This is not meant to devalue, but this is meant to give hard data so individuals can gather some situational awareness and make solid judgment calls in reference to the risk versus the benefit. To proceed, that only 41% of children's deaths reported from SARS-CoV-2 infections were from COVID-19. I'll repeat, however, again, these numbers often include children who died with a SARS-CoV-2 infection and not because of it. And it showed that only 41% of child deaths reported from SARS-CoV-2 infections were from COVID-19, which means, for example, if we look at our data, if we look at the age mortality breakdown per CDC, and just to, to basically validate the information for you, age data from the CDC itself. So this is actually from the CDC data on its own. We look at this and we are going to be looking at, now think of it this way. Five, let's say they make this a little, little smaller here. Whoops. Sorry for that. All right. So we look at that. Is that it doesn't even make the graph. So it's 576 children during the entire pandemic from the ages of 0 to 17 years of age, who unfortunately and tragically have succumbed to COVID-19. Now, however, though, if the number is 41%, then you can adjust this number accordingly, and it'll be far less. And that's just to give you a good, solid perspective. And this is basically the age groups, if you want to look at, for example, which we'll cover the data in a little bit regardless. So, and but... Otherwise, I wanted to bring this attention to you right off the bat uh, because obviously there's a lot of debate going on in schools, vaccines are being approved for children, and it, it's only fair to present the data in a way which the British Medical Journal has done a great job in this particular review uh, in order to make a rational judgment call per se, the parent or basically any advisory committee. All right, so let's look at the data we're going to be covering tonight, right off the bat. And by the way, good evening. We're a little early tonight. It is now November 6, 2021 at 1119 p.m. as we're looking. And good evening to our data analyst, uh, basically data scientists, bioinformatics, epidemiologists, uh, policymakers, and so on and so forth, and our wonderful, wonderful, small but precious uh, data-orientated audience, which I am humbled that you watch. So let us begin as follows. We're looking at the inhibition of SARS-CoV-2 infection and replication by lactoferrin, mucin, and or mucin one, and alpha lactalbumin, lactalbumin identified in human breast milk. All right, again, this is great information because it is validating the other information that we received earlier that there's something there with lactoferrin, something really, really. I, would, I don't want to say magical because that takes away the uh, the science type venue per se, but it appears that way. We're looking at it. Lactoferrin is being confirmed over and over again of showing great, great potential in mitigating a lot of the negative outcomes in reference to basically this p pandemic. And the cool part about this article, which I don't want to cover right off the bat well, we'll, until we look at everything else first, is that it also goes from mother to child transmission through breastfeeding. And it gives you the data in relation to that 
on what's the probability of that occurring. All right, but let us proceed at the other articles first. Next, we go into immune response from neonates born to mothers infected with SARS-CoV-2, which is a really good follow-up to this research article here. And then we look at this. We'll cover this a third. Should children be vaccinated against COVID-19? The links will be there on the YouTube channel. You could bring it into there. If you have any school boards, school administrators, or anything else like that, uh, it's real important information they have at hand and not just you know go with the flow because it's just too much problem to think. All right, then we go. We look at this. Age and sex-specific incidence of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, which is kind of weird because in a lot of it, it really hurts. This is the, not like myocarditis where it affects the males. Uh, this really affects females to a great extent, uh, but it's in this particular vaccine, not to cover other vaccines, but I want to show you the risk of uh, benefit. Uh, they, the researcher here believes that the, the risk of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis is not a reason not to get vaccinated. But again, each person to their own to proceed as follows. Uh, you remember what I said a long, long time ago, eventually somehow your pets are going to get involved. Uh, yeah, well, we'll go over that one in a second too. All right. Then after that, uh, vaccine induced humoral and cellular immunity against SARS-CoV-2 at six months post BDNT's 162B2 vaccinate vaccination. And what you'll discover is in this wonderful article is they really don't know how the vaccines work or how they don't work per se. They do know that it protects against potentially, uh, you know, serious infection. Uh, but what they've been gauging the vaccines off of, I'll just give you a little head, headlight, uh, headlight, a little preview, I should say, right off the bat. What they've been gauging it off of demonstrated a surprising decrease to 1 15th after three weeks. And the same trend was noted for neutralizing teeters and so on and so forth. So, what they thought was the thing that was making the vaccines work may not be the thing that's making the vaccines work. All right, proceed, and we'll come to that one in a second, and we'll go into more detail. Three weeks, one fifteenth. That's that's whoa. That's what I, that blew me away. They just what they did is they did a new they used a new method of testing, and that's what they discovered. All right, so proceed. All right, then study in much of the U.S. virtual school did not lower COVID-19 cases, case rates, I should say, in surrounding communities. I'll have the link, but let's just get this one out of the way real fast. Um, that's what the title says. That virtual school did not lower COVID-19 case rates in surrounding communities. So, yeah, it's the, pro it's the problem with things that may sound good uh, that don't necessarily mean that they are good and again uh, we had a very 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 um, basic way of thinking during this pandemic and um, the data didn't support uh, virtual school uh, as far as reducing community transmission obviously now here's a catch though there were some areas in the south that did have an increase for about two weeks but after that mm, no in all of the regions, community case rates during the period following school opening were similar, regardless of whether the school was virtual, hybrid, or in person. A note to take from that, California. So we'll get this one out of the way, and we'll just say it's covered, and I'll have a link for you later on. Social isolation uh, impacts brain function in significant, sometimes permanent ways. I will reiterate that. Permanent ways. Again, this comes down to pandemic mitigation factors. Are we willing to basically... Uh, protect ourselves against uncertainty weaponized uncertainty is the way i have to say it because politically it has been weaponized no doubt about it uh in favor of certain harms that will occur any of you that have individuals that have been isolated in nursing homes long-term care facilities seen this happen in a lot of their loved ones without a doubt and it actually gives a good breakdown of what parts of the brain are associated with the changes and let's just read a little, look at this one out of the way too. The research showed that social isolation impacts many brain regions and affects many different behaviors, resulting in increased risk for disease. So you, you, you're, there's the uncertainty. You're training for, you're trading for a certainty. You, there's a chance that someone may get ill in a long-term care facility or nursing home, but by isolating them for two years, 
uh, you're trading that uncertainty for certainty in which basically creates a whole other issue. The pandemic has had a tremendous effect on our mental health. The research will provide us with insights about specific neural circuits, mediate the behavioral effects induced by social isolation, which they can try to find ways to restore these neural circuits, counteracting the consequences of social isolation, oxytocin, dopamine, so on and so forth. And as it says right off the bat, humans are a highly social species who crave social contact for the well-being, i.e. YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, so on and so forth. Maybe, you know, not necessarily in a beneficial way, but still. Loneliness induced by social isolation can cause significant neurological and behavioral changes that may lead to health issues. All of the links there, for the findings, it really gives a good thing. And it's a policy issue. But again, permanent damage from isolation, it needs to be truly taken into account when analyzing risk versus benefit. So certain pandemic mitigation factors. And I've, you know, and from the very beginning, we've seen this, but it doesn't seem like anybody's really listening. Next, after that, uh, COVID-19, governments must stop va vaccine cost secrecy. I'll have the links. Let's get this one out of the way as well, too. Do you want to know how much it costs? Now, they're now willing to tell you. How, this is why I don't like. This is this is the raises so many red flags with me, and this is part of the reason why I get concerned in regard to hesitancy building because I don't like secrecy about so many different issues being, you know, uh, this cloud of uh, unknowns. Why are these things secret? If they want to keep this secret, then what else they want to keep secret? You know what I mean? That the typical uh, cascade effect. Lower cost and detailed study of RMNRA vaccines estimate the unit cost is about $2.85 for Moderna and $1.18 for Pfizer. And it gives a good breakdown and the links will be there as well. Um, I like things in the open. I don't know why they got to make things so mysterious. And we covered this last week as well, too, in reference to conflicts of interest. Um, if things are going to be transparent and you really want to establish trust, and you don't want conspiracies to start arising. Conspiracy is not really the fault of the conspiracy theorist. Yeah, this is my this is my hypothesis. Conspiracies arise when entrusted or purportedly trusted bureaucrats breach that one given of trust. And once people start to question the motivation uh, and integrity of your bureaucrat, then people start beginning to come up with these hypotheses of why, uh, why, how, when, where. Obviously, if they're not being honest about one thing. Then you see that gives birth to many other uh, often, you know, I would just say, uh, how vectors in uh, conspiracies. So you want to reduce conspiracies down. You want to, you won't reduce them all. Uh, develop a term transparent form of uh, bureaucratic establishments and stop keeping secrets. Not good. That's the whole premise of a conspiracy to start with. All right, data we're going to be covering as well, too, before we get into data. We'll be looking at VAERS and the disclaimers there. While very important monitoring vaccine safety, VAERS reports alone cannot be used to determine if a vaccine caused or contributed to an adverse event or illness. Reports may contain information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, and or unverifiable. We'll be looking at European database, which basically has the same things like that, except for fatal designations can be overestimated because they will have a fatal designation attached to the symptom as opposed to fatal designation attached to the ID or the report. And that creates some confusion, but we'll cover that in a little bit too. The GISA, we'll look at the different, um, uh, a few different variants popping up in France. It's basically an other thing. We'll check in a second. And of course, the, the famous, God, was by infamous, Our World in Data, which has done a great job this entire uh, pandemic. Uh, it's from Oxford University, I think, maintains it. But to proceed with the first article as follows. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Inhibition of SARS-CoV-2 infection and replication by lactoferrin, mucin-1, and alpha-lactalbumin, albumin, identified in human breast milk. And I'm just going to read the highlights because it's a really well um, laid out uh, full text article, which you can read I mean, over and over again and find something new each time. So best for me not to uh, 
incorporate publisher bias and have the link for you to go to it on your own. But let's first, let's take some, let's, how would you say, let's refine some of the information uh, from this particular study. Additionally, we found that lactoferrin in mucin, one could inhibit viral attachment entry and post-entry replication. Moreover, lactoferrin from other species, bovine and goat, this is important too, because obviously, you know, human lactoferrin is not going to be readily available per se. But however, though, we're going to use correlation. So there may be a correlation that bovine and goat lactoferrin may be as effective as the human. Now, we did in the study last week, no, a couple of weeks ago, we showed lactoferrin from the animal sources worked well too. But again, if for me to draw that correlation on my own, just reading it, that in itself is publisher bias. So because I am, I, it makes sense, it's a good hypothesis, but that's not what the researchers are researching. They're researching the lactoferrin from human breast milk. But to proceed, and you can draw the correlations on your own. More of a lactoferrin from other species, but when a goat is still capable of blocking viral attachment to cellular, cellular heparin sulfate to get taken together. Our study provided the first line of evidence that human breast milk components, lactoferrin, mucin 1, and uh, lactoalbumin, lactoalbumin, alpha lactoalbumin, are promising therapeutic candidates warranting further development or treating, now it looks like a little typo though, COVID-19 given their exceedingly safety levels. All right, to proceed. As previously reported, the COVID-19 pandemic also confers great concern of mother-to-child transmission by breastfeeding. In addition to the report of SARS-CoV-2, RNA was detected in human breast milk. It was still unclear that SARS-CoV-2 could transmit to infants through breastfeeding. All right, without revealing uh, the outcome to that particular statement, just let's say towards the end, they'll clear it up for you. Several evidences in the clinic study showed that SARS-CoV-2 couldn't transmit to infants by breastfeeding. However, it is controversial if live COV-2 existing in breast milk could still be infectious. Breast milk could inhibit several viruses and several virus infections, such as human. This is interesting because I didn't know this. So please forgive me if I read through it a couple of times because it is amazing to me. Breast milk could inhibit several viruses and infections, such as human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, cytomegalovirus, CMV, and dengue virus. It is reported that breast milk can not only inhibit several enveloped viruses such as herpes simplex type 1 and 2, HIV, and CMV, but it also showed effective activity in vitro against many non-enveloped viruses like rotavirus, enterovirus, and adenovirus. Why is it bouncing from line to line? Hopefully you can follow it. The lactoferrin is an important component in breast milk could suppress SARS-CoV-1, I assume, and SARS-CoV-2 through blocking virus to bind heparin sulfate of proteoglycans, raising concern that human breast milk can also, I don't know if that's a concern or a hope, that human breast milk can also suppress SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now, I'm narrating, so for those not familiar with the, the channel, I'm just narrowly, narr narrowing narrating some of the highlights uh, from the research so you can go to the link on your own. Uh, how would you say, uh, give you a taste of the research per se, whet your appetite and therefore you can delve into it further. Breast, breast milk is an extremely complex, is an extremely complex to nourish infants and protect them from, you can see different ways people write sentences. So if you hear me just back off a little bit or potentially uh, stumble, it's because sometimes the, um, the language doesn't flow smoothly different kinds of disease. It may also contain 400 different proteins and many of them exhibit antimicrobial activity. Proteins in human milk can be divided into three groups, caseins, mucin, and whey proteins. These bioactive proteins from the whey faction include lactoferrin, mucin 1, and fewer in, and alpha lacta, lacta, that's like a tongue twister, lactalbumin, lactalbumin, um, lactoherin, lactoperoxidase, immunoglobulin A, Lysozyme, Lyso, LZ, and so on. Lactoferrin is an iron binding protein with two molecules, blah, 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 per protein enriched in human milk. Well, 
Nah, this, or it is rich. It is rich. See what I mean by the flow of the sentences? It is rich in human milk. And it said basically uh, gives you the amount uh, in colostrum as well, five to ten grams, one to two grams a liter in mature milk, five to ten grams a liter in colostrum. So this. By doing this, this gives you a perspective, at least from the animal aspect to the human aspect, for those that want to delve into the possible uh, relationship between what's the equivalency, which relatively low in other species, such as bonafide milk, which is 0.02 to 0.3 grams a liter. One to two grams in mature milk, 0.02 to 0.3 in mature milk for bovine, and two to five grams a liter in colostrum. There's your equivalency, right? As reported previously, lactoferrin is an important component to protect infants from microbes and virus infection. And basically, the LZ is also known to be a key protein inhibiting bacteria with restriction human milk, per se. And that was basically the lysosomes. Now I can pronounce it. All right, lact lactoferrin, and it goes on and on. Well, well, let me just go to the next highlight. In addition, human milk also contains antibodies like immunoglobulin A and immunoglobulin G and immunoglobulin A, a little dyslexic there which show antiviral activity. Therefore, these gave us confidence to continue to identify the anti-SARS-CoV-2 components in breast milk and explore the underlying mechanisms. And wonderful, wonderful articles and highlights there and so on and so forth, but I'm just gonna go towards the end. And I think right here, there should be one of the highlights in one of the, the uh, charts here, right here. Check this out, here it goes, ready? This compares the different, this is the different variants. So looking at beta, gamma, kappa, and I believe we have alpha here. So just to give you an idea as far as how it works against them. All right, for example, there's your lactoferrin, there's mucin, and lactalbumin, lactalbumin. All right, so you see the effectiveness of the lactoferrin, for example, right there and there, and then move that down there. And so you can see the gamma and the kappa. And so therefore you can see the, the, the basically how effective it is against each one. All right, now just to get more to the data again, let's keep it going. All right, proceed. Although many clinical studies didn't find solid information of COVID-19 related MTCT through breastfeeding, SARS-CoV-2 posit uh, positive in breast milk still confer great concern for the safety of breastfeeding to infants from SARS-CoV-2 infected mothers. Chambers had all reported that they collected the positive breast milk from 18 infected women and tested the ineffectivity in the cell culture system. They didn't find any viral RNA positive in the experiments, indicating that SARS-CoV-2 in breast milk can't infect and transmit. To reiterate, they collected positive breast milk from 18 infected women and tested the ineffectivity in the cell culture system. Quote, obviously quoting, they didn't find any viral RNA positive in the experiments, indicating that SARS-CoV-2 in the breast milk can't infect and transmit. Consistent to this, our previous published work also showed that even we added, and this again, this goes to the flow of the sentences, so that even when we added the live viruses at relatively high concentrations in the breast milk, the virus still could not infect the cells, suggesting that human breast milk has high quality, has high quality, is high quality in ant or does possess high quality in anti SARS CoV 2 infection. SARS CoV 2 belongs to an RNA virus and is easily mutate, uh, easy to mutate during the infection, which resulting in viral escape from antibody neutralization, vaccination, and other drugs, targeting the interaction between the S protein and the ACE2. Surprisingly, lactoferrin, mucin 1, and lactablamum could inhibit the existing mutants such as alpha, beta, gamma, and kappa, indicating the strong effects and broad spectrum of these for inhibiting SARS-CoV-2 infection. Be curious in reference to delta, but to proceed. As for the alpha lactoferrin, it seems that the uh, lactalbumum could only block viral attachment to cells to, in, uh, to uh, interfere viral bond to a viral binding to ACE2 receptors. So collectively, we identified, this, let's read this part right here. There we go. Collectively, we identified several factors from human breast milk, lactoferrin, mucin 1, and alpha, and lactoalbumin effectively inhibit SARS-CoV-2 and their variants, infections, and replication by viral attachment, entry and post-entry replication. Although our findings are promising and showed its potential role in safety of breast milk feeding in the clinic, further studies need to confirm our findings, and guess what? 
right over here from the Journal of American Medical Association. Immune response in neonates born to mothers infected with SARS-CoV-2. Ready? Here we go. Findings. This is a separate study. Keep this in mind. In this cohort, study of 21 mothers who tested positive for SARS-CoV-2 at delivery and their 22 newborns, there was one case of potential mother-infant vertical virus transmission and one case of horizontal virus transmission. Infants who received breast milk during the first two months of life had significantly higher spike-specific salivary immunoglobulin A. Remember, we just covered a little bit, of, little, a little bit ago in reference to the lactoferrin one. Antibody levels compare with formula-fed infants. An immunoglobulin A spike immune complex were detected in breast milk. And to go to the bottom here. Ba -ba 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 -ba. Do, 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 do. I like how these studies, they always tend to, um, it's interesting. You do one study of one thing, and then there'll also be three studies from different parts of the world that pop up at the exact same time and the exact same thing in different ways. All right, the cohort study found that SARS-CoV-2 spike-specific immunoglobulin A antibodies were detected in the saliva of infants who received breast milk and were exposed in utero and in the early neonatal period to the virus. They were exposed to early neonatal period to the virus but were never infected. Our findings indicate that the mother's immune system stimulates and trains. This is so important. I know looking to vaccinate a lot of females during pregnancy, but I really wonder if by some odd chance that could interfere with this immunological process for basically lifelong immunity in exchange for potentially just temporary. Proceed. Our findings indicate that the mother's immune system stimulates and trains the neonatal immune system for active protection via delivery of breast milk immune complexes, extending previous work showing that mothers provide passive defense to the newborns by transplacental passage of maternal immunoglobulin G antibodies and by high SLJA antibodies via breast milk. The SARS-CoV-2 pandemic has shown that although this pathogen, which has never been encountered by humans, frequently infects adults and elderly individuals who may develop severe and even lethal disease. Children and infants rarely have symptomatic and acute COVID-19. All right, now keep in mind. Now you see how that plays a role right there? That plays a role with this research that we just covered right here. Let's go to the top in reference to that. And it also plays a role in this research. But to proceed, children and infants rarely have symptomatic and acute COVID-19. The resistance of children to SARS-CoV-2 infection and disease is a subject of an intense ongoing research. And again, they mentioned in this case, salivary immunoglobulin A, and which was obviously mentioned in this research article here, which I'm not going to try to find RGA, where it just went, but still, you get the picture. And it's quite quite intriguing, yeah, uh, the, you quite intriguing, immunoglobulin A, uh, right there, see, ba -ba, right there, and what they cover, I'm sorry about that, I just, I just like drawing the connections, that's, that's kind of what I like to do, uh, ba -ba, right again, interesting, see how it connects, all right, next, let's go to the next article reference here, uh, to should children be vaccinated against COVID-19, I am going to repeat, there's something called selection bias, Selection bias is where you're basically nitpicking information, picking out the information that you want to see, and sometimes that takes things out of context. So we are going to look at this, because I can't read the whole article. We are going to basically delve into a little bit of selection bias, and I'm going to pull out some highlights. But in fairness, best to read the entire research article, especially if you bring something like this to your school board. Uh, if provided they actually still listen to parents. But to proceed as follows. All right, let's pull some highlights. Uh, da, 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 da. All right, results from the same trial in children, the benefits and risk of vaccinating children against COVID-19. Results from the same trial in children under five years of age are expected to be done by the end of 2021. So they're still doing studies. Uh, so you look at the end of 2021. Rare adverse effects are difficult to detect with such sample sizes. So you're going to understand what I mean. If you have like two people per million, but you're only doing right here less than 4,000 participants, uh, then you're really not going to have a strong enough power rating to detect 
what could be a long-term uh, ailments that could possibly arise uh, from various vaccines, uh, even short-term, but to proceed. Results from the trial said by the end of 21, rare adverse events are difficult to detect with such sample sizes and often seen only after large scale use. See again, the risk to benefit ratio. We know what the risk is, 0.005. What's the risk of long-term problems? Again, we don't know. Outside clinical trials, millions of adolescents between the age of 12 and 18 have been vaccinated, including 13 million in the USA. Arguments for and against vaccinating children against COVID-19 are summarized in table one. And if, again, for those that want to look through the whole, entire article, you'll see arguments against, arguments against COVID-19 vaccination, uh, arguments for. So let's not, so right down the line, you can break, you can basically cover in your own debate class if you, if you should so choose. All right, proceed. I'm going to reiterate this action and then we'll move pretty full, fast through the entire article. COVID-19 is generally a mild disease in children with less than 2% of symptomatic children require in hospital admission. The rate of, remember, how is this against influenza and other ailments per se like that? Uh, you know, with, we've been living with for, for who knows how long. Uh, so again, have to put things in context. The rate of intensive care admission of hospitalized children ranges from 2 to 13 percent, higher rates 10 to 25, up to 33 in some studies, are reported from the USA. However, these numbers often include children who are hospitalized with COVID-19 and not because of COVID-19, and therefore overestimate the severity. Why is that? It'd be such an easy thing to be able to delineate, and it's so tough to go through the data. Why? the virtue signaling in reference to COVID-19 diagnosis. In children and adolescents, the risk of death from SARS-CoV-2 infection as we covered is 0.005%, but notes there. And those who are hospitalized with COVID-19, it is 0% to 0.7%, but notes there. However, again, these numbers often include children who died with a SARS-CoV-2 infection, not because of it. A recent population-based study showed that only 41% of child deaths reported from SARS-CoV-2 infections were actually from COVID-19. Therefore, the prevention of SARS-CoV-2 infection is not as strong an argument for vaccinating all healthy children as it is for adults. Nevertheless, this might change if new variants emerge, uncertainty, that's what we're looking at, which cause more severe disease in otherwise healthy children. And that's if the new variants emerge, would the vaccine even offer protection against it? if there's such a variant that should emerge. You see what I mean where this goes? You cannot, you cannot mitigate all uncertainty and every action you take has a collateral effect somewhere else, closing schools, isolation, so on and so forth. All right, proceed down the line. The low risk of hospitalization and death from COVID-19 not, may not be a good argument against vaccine and against this disease as the risk is similar or even higher than that for other diseases which vaccines are routinely giving such as varicella, rubella, hepatitis A, and influenza. In addition, if a high proportion of children are infected, even a very low rate of severe illness might translate to a high absolute number of cases. Moreover, in low middle income, that adult will go forward, perceived. However, more recent studies done since the Delta variant became dominant show that similar vi Here, read this again. It's footnoted. However, recent studies done since the Delta variant became dominant shows similar viral loads in vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals. For the Delta variant, it has been suggested that the infected fully vaccinated individuals are as likely to transmit SARS-CoV-2 as infected unvaccinated individuals, although for a shorter duration. So basically by mandating vaccines and everything else like that, um, if the duration of the illness is important, then maybe it may have an impact. But if you're not doing mandatory testing of vaccinated individuals, but you are doing of unvaccinated, yet the vaccinated individuals are just as likely to not only have the virus, but transmit it, but it may be five days instead of seven days. But what difference does it make if you're going to a place of employment or a school? You know, and again, I know you can say, well, the longer you're exposed with the, the, an infected person, yeah, now you're 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 heading down a slippery slope as far as length of exposure time required to uh, manifest an infection, because 
So then if that's the case, it requires five days to manifest an infection or seven, then then why do you have all these restrictions on restaurants and so on and so forth and every other place? If now you know, you see where the argument goes? That's what I meant by slippery slope. Even with the Delta variant, the transmission rate from adults to children was eight percent. From children to adults, one point three percent. And from children to children, one point eight percent. Another consideration is that once SARS CV-2 becomes endemic, which it looks like it is, now this is an interesting aspect. But the argument that we're about to uh, broach here is as follows. Would it be better for, if it's endemic and it's going to be around forever, you have two arguments. Continual vaccination, maybe once every six months, since the vaccine seems to basically plummet to, to whatever after six months, uh, until they come up with better vaccines, let's say, whatever. Or would it be better to be exposed to SARS-CoV-2 as a child when your immune system is really ramped up against it for whatever unknown reasons. And therefore, by the time you're an adult, you have a greater uh, potentially a natural immunity. I know the big argument is against you don't have natural immunity to it, but those are, those that, no, it, it, it doesn't appear to be the case now. Yeah, a lot of studies are coming out showing that immunity may be long lasting, um, natural immunity. Uh, primary SARS CoV-2, but not necessarily vaccine induced immunity. Interesting. Says primary SARS CoV-2 early child. Let, let me begin in the beginning because I was mumbling. Another consideration is that once SARS CoV-2 becomes endemic, primary SARS CoV-2 infection in early childhood, when COVID-19 is mild, with subsequent boosting from the ongoing exposure at older ages, may bring about population immunity as seen with common circulating coronaviruses more effectively than mass immunization. I'm going to repeat that. So you see the argument. What he's trying to imply is, all right, well, you can vaccinate your vulnerable population, but if you vaccinate your children, well, or if you don't, let's say, for example, they don't vaccinate their children, then those children, as they become adults with chronic exposure year after year after year, I'll eventually develop potentially, because I don't want to use conjecture, a strong natural immunity and therefore problem solved. But to proceed, I'll reiterate it again. I'm going to repeat. Another consideration is that once SARS-CoV-2 infection, SARS-CoV-2 becomes endemic, meaning lasting in the environment for good, primary SARS-CoV-2 infection in early childhood when COVID-19 is mild, with subsequent boosting from ongoing exposure at older age, may, again may, so it's a good hypothesis, bring about population immunity, as seen with the common circulating coronaviruses more effectively than mass immunization. Remember their, their, what their selling point was in the beginning. Once we had 70% vaccination, and that's with even without even natural immunity, then herd immunity will be obtained, will be achieved. Well, that's the problem. They've been wrong every single time, it seems like. I would like, I'm still waiting to know when they're going to be right. But you get the point. So this, this the research article here basically is implying, or the editorial, the argument, is look, uh, they're not as vulnerable. You know, take that into consideration. 0 0.005 and then 41% of that potentially. You know where I'm going with, with that. As opposed to the risk of inoculation. Again, long-term safety. The lack of long-term safety data is another consideration. Longer-term follow-up of myocarditis cases is needed to be excluded, exclude, to exclude any possibility of myocardial fibrosis and associated dysfunction or arrhythmia risk. Two studies showed a high prevalence of late gadolinium enhancement in MRIs in patients suffering from post-vaccine myocarditis. Two studies showed a high prevalence of late gadolinium enhancement in MRIs in patients suffering from post-vaccine myocarditis. Further studies are needed to establish whether it this resolves or evolves into fibrosis. As discussed above, information on this risk is also needed for myocarditis resulting from SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what the researchers are claiming is you have to look at the background rates. Although the majority of adverse vaccine effects occur early after vaccination, 
any unforeseen adverse effects could undermine vaccine confidence and reduce vaccination rates against other diseases. That's part of my argument too. They're pushing so hard that basically you may breach trust on more areas than just one. But, and that's basically the article, the arguments for and against, so on and so forth. But I'll have the links for you there. I don't want to read the entire article. It's, again, it's incredible uh, tidbits of information in there uh, that need to be brought into consideration. But it does help uh, to have and help an individual postulate a good argument either for or against. To proceed, age and sex-specific incidents of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis associated with basically the Janssen one. Uh, COVID-19 vaccination. So AD 26 COV-2.S. Uh, here we go. And this is where the excerpt is. Now the research are saying here, the risk of COVID is, is greater. But I want to read you the risk that they discovered in reference to basically this particular outcome. The post-vaccination CVST rate among females was 5.1 fold higher compared with pre-COVID-19 pandemic rates. Now we're talking, that's what I mean by background rates. Background rates is meaning how much CSVT do you normally have without vac this vaccination come into play? So looking at 5.1 fold higher per 100,000. This risk was highest among women between the ages of 40 to 49. There's your risk and so on and so forth. And to proceed, most CVST events occurred within 15 days after vaccination which is likely the highest at risk period. The post-vaccination CVST rate among females is higher than the pre-pandemic rate among females. The highest risk was among women aged 30 to 49. They said 40 to 49 here. Uh, but the absolute CVST risk was still low in this age group among women that put their 40 to 49. The reason that women had a higher incidence of post-vaccination CVST is unclear. See, we're all thinking males and myocarditis. Now, uh, now we're looking at females in reference to this particular vaccination and cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. All right, so all tongue twisters. Here we go. Uh, concomitant, concomitant CVST risk factors or autoantibody production might have been involved. And there's the reference point for those who want to follow that, follow that rabbit. The overall pre-pandemic CVST incident rate was slightly higher in our study than other studies, likely because we captured all objectively diagnosed incidences of CVST cases in a well-defined population, including those discovered at autopsy. Yeah, that sounds comforting, doesn't it? All right, proceed to the next one. Again, eventually I have a feeling if things, treatments, prophylactics, whatever, herd immunity does not be, whatever. This kind of concerns me. Now I'm gonna read you what the researcher said and I'll leave it at that. This is the first documents, first trend, US transmission of COVID from a pet owner to pets. Now the scary part is if it goes back from pets to basically the owner. But I'm gonna read you what they believe the proper pandemic mitigation aspect should be so you don't infect your pet. And I, out of respect for the researcher itself, I am just going to reiterate it without uh, attempting to create any inflection in my voice that can display bias or, you know, no, well, let's just begin. They said, according to the researcher, pet owners should protect their pets by getting vaccinated. If they do get COVID, they should wear a mask when they are around their pets. As difficult it might be for many pet owners, they should avoid cuddling, kissing, allowing pets to lick their faces, or sleeping with them. Owners don't have to completely isolate from their pets, but they should minimize contact as the best they can while they exhibit COVID-19 symptoms. In this case study, the pet parent was not yet vaccinated, took the precaution to protect his cat and dog, and entrain, entertained, entrain, entertained guests who were not vaccinated. The owner recovered from COVID, and both his pets were asymptomatic. And so far, there have been 14 positive cases of COVID in pets among six of, the, six of the households. So just keep that in mind. Hopefully it never goes back from pet to owner, but a lot of a lot of ailments out there have animal reservoirs, which makes it endemic. But just, I always bring this up. I'm always worried eventually it's going to take a, a turn for the worst and they're going to start coming after pets. Just a heads up, a word of caution. 
to proceed. Vaccine-induced humoral, humoral and cellular immunity against SARS-CoV-2 at six months post BNT162B2 vaccination. This is a lesson basically in reference to not whether the vaccine works or doesn't, is how little we actually do know. And now this goes back and plays into this because of how little we actually do know. And how they thought vaccines work may not be the way they work. And again, that's my concern. But to proceed as follows, where are we? Here we are. Let's read the highlights. However, the efficacy of a vaccine in preventing severe disease reported to remain at a high level. Again, how? We're not certain. The, the teeter of immunoglobulins, remember immunoglobulin G against spike proteins, back to, do, 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 we just looked at immunoglobulin A, and now there's immunoglobulin G as well, because we covered it here from the basic lactoferrin. But to proceed forward, it goes against spike proteins. Induced by the vaccine dropped to 7% in six months. 7% now. That's not the vaccine waning. That's the vaccine self-destructing. However, though, there's a caveat. The decline in efficacy for preventing the infection can be attributed to the decrease in can be attributed to the decrease in antibody teeter, although the prevention of severe disease cannot be explained by antibody teeter alone, and cellular immunity may be involved. Again, the the takeaway here is to they're trying to figure out how the vaccine works. All right. To proceed forward, going down the article, the links will be there for you to delve into on your own. But when I read this 7% in six months, what they thought was working down to the 7% in six months, wow, to proceed. And again, we're looking at risk to benefit ratios, or if there could be a better vaccine around the corner. You know what I mean? To proceed. At six months of receiving the second dose of the BNT162B2 vaccine, uh, SP specific, you can call spike protein. Specific immunoglobulin G decreased markedly, with the mean GMT decreased from 95.2 at three weeks after vaccination to 5.7 at six months. Just if you don't understand what that is, just look at the decline. Think of what they think is supposed to be working at 95.2 is now at 5.7. A previous and remember, even if the vaccine was working, look at all the breakthrough infections at, at you know a short period of time after the vac after inoculation. A previous report showed that a peak at one week after two doses and, de and decreased to 7% at six months, as we reiterated before. Our data using the CLIA method demonstrated a surprising decrease to 1 15th after three weeks of vaccination. 1 15th. Three weeks. 1 15th. That's what you're supposed to be doing to get a booster every month now. And the same trend was noted for neutralizing teeters, dieter teeters, which also depicted a marked decrease. However, the correlation between cellular immunity assessed and spike, specific, uh, spike protein specific T cell response and spike protein immunoglobulin index teeter at neutralizing teeters was weak, suggesting that cellular immunity may have a different dynamic from the antibody teeter, dieter teeter. So you see what I mean? What it, this, it's not the fact we're not making an argument whether the vaccine works or not. It's basically what we think is supposed to be working in the vaccine is not what's actually doing the job. So it's not meant to erode confidence per se. It's just to put you in perspective. The more we know, the more we don't know. And going back to knowing that there's so much that we don't know, and then you go back to this, about knowing how much we don't know now, when we thought we knew it all a few months ago. Remember, there was no such breakthrough infections were rare and so on and so forth. Remember that whole diatribe? And, or a hundred days of mask wear and bring it to an end or give us two weeks, we'll flatten the curve. Uh, yeah, shall I continue? But you see what I mean? So the links will be there as, as follows. I think that was, oh, here we go. However, our study demonstrated that antibody teeters, titers, do not necessarily correlate with cellular immunity, indicating that the dynamics of cellular immunity are different from those of humoral immunity and suggesting that the evaluation of cellular immunity is warranted for long-term evaluation of the efficacy of SARS-CoV-2 infection and story. All right, let's go to other studies. Here we go. Ba -ba. Uh, we went through this. Yeah, that's So 
a lot of what we've done, unfortunately, was probably done with the right motivation, but in vain. This we covered as well. And the cost of the vaccines, I don't know why the secrecy, but that's what they estimate. That's not necessarily what it is, but that's their hypothesis because no one's talking. All right, now here we go into our data as follows. We are going to be looking at the various database, or this disclaimer as follows. These just reports to various data, not reports from. They have to be validated. Same thing goes for the European database, GIS aid, our world and data, and let us begin. Here we go. Ba -ba -bam. All right, this was our age group. We went through this a few seconds ago. This is the average age of mortality, but we are going to start with the VARES one because this is the one that basically uh, attracts people's attention most often. And I'm going to pull this up real fast. And here we go. Any second now. There we are. All right. Now I'm going to put down a boop and let's come on. There we go. Let's go back down. And there, there. Ah, darn it. Now I'm going to hang on one second. Be right back. Right back. And back. Now, the reason I'm doing this here, what, what, what this display is right here, you see is duplicate report IDs. And we're looking at the VARES Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting Database from the CDC. Is I'm really delving into the database right now because I'm beginning to notice a trend where reports are uh, reports being submitted to VARES uh, are becoming later and later. And so I'm noticing spikes now about 28 days, meaning we're looking at longer term or adverse events that do not or adverse effects that are being reported to VARES that may not be immediate, like at the time of inoculation or vaccination. So when you look at this number here, 926,328, it's real tempting to say that there's been 926,328 uh, events reported to VARES. And that's not the case because actually there's only 654,983. Reason being is people have so many side effects sometimes, report so many side effects to, to basically the CDC, that it results in 271,345 duplicate duplicated reports. So that throws the figures way off. It makes it very difficult sometimes to do a little bit of research because you may say that you have tons of cases of myocarditis, but reality it's one person with 20 different reports. And so it uh, inflates or conflates the figures. So just keep that in mind. So if you can see sometimes duplicated report IDs, let's see if I can show you. Uh, let's make this a little bigger so it's easier for you to read. And you can go through the whole line there. I think we made it bigger, did we? There. And so you can see. Now, I want to go, go. Now, you may notice a little bit of reduction, like these are server injuries, because I'm also cleaning up the database quite, um, trying to get rid of all these duplicates. And it may be a little overkill, but I'd much rather, I'd much rather have a right. Look at the symptoms right there. Arthralgia. And um, this isn't. This is on Serva. And so you, I mean, so you have to get rid of those duplicates, but you can read if you want to, uh, a lot of the reports that people are, are having uh, in reference to certain types of vaccines uh, per se. Now we're going to be focusing more on the code ones, not the pneumococcal and so on and so forth. And that's the average age. Shingles, 11,346. Well, let's just go down to the bottom here. This because we're always so short for time and we're already 50 minutes in. And so da, 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 da. we'll cover these cases as well. But I'll stop. This, here's the duplicated IDs. For example, here was one individual, a very unfortunate individual, VARES ID 1591843. And you see what I mean by duplicates? This is all the duplicates they had. These are all the symptoms they've had. But it created at least over 25 different uh, files in one individual, which can conflate the figures. All right. And you can read through here as well, too. And I'm trying to go slow because some people like they see, they see something that catches their eye. So it gives them an opportunity to look at it a little bit more. All right. Now, this is the reactions per vaccine. This is the value counts. For example, you see Zoster right there, 7,224. But there is obviously COVID, da 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 Oh, let's just get this out of the way, too. Since we're looking at this real fast, let's, uh, let's, no, let's, let's continue with the virus. I apologize. All right. So we're looking at 654,983 reports submitted, individuals uh, being, uh, 
being submitted to VARES. There's 900,000 reports submitted to VARES, but, but only 654,983 individuals that had reactions supported the VARES. You see what I mean? So you can't, if they're filling out, you know, six or seven forms or six or seven reports, it's still only one person, but they have seven reports. So you really have to look at how you, whether you're focused on the number of reports uh, or the number of individuals. I hope you understand that. All right, to proceed, all right, for vaccine reactions by age. Right now we have 8,268 mortality reports submitted to VARES. Now, a lot of people say, well, it's the background level. But if you look at the, read these reports, uh, they're, they're pretty detailed. And it, it it's basically, they, they happen fairly rapidly after vaccination. If you read the reports or submit it for fairly rapidly. Obviously not by the individual, but by other healthcare providers. Uh, now let's keep on going, da, 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 per se, uh, by week. Let's go forth and let's go to the synopsis data. Do, 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 do. All right, this one is other individuals um, that may have passed away. You can read the symptom text there. I'll, I'll highlight it for a second. Uh, you know, a lot of things like this, you, they don't know. Uh, you see what they say, suspected myocarditis. Uh, and then there's a, a t uh, tons of tragic stories. Um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of this. Uh, this was my, you know, sudden cardiac death. It, it's, yeah, and you can read through them. Um, so on and so forth. All right, to proceed. This is the number of vaccine reports submitted to VAERS. Uh, in 2021 so far, as we said, compared to all of 2020. So I'll just give you that perspective. All right, keep it going. And da, 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 da. I'm going to pass by these real fast for time and expediency. I'll break the children one down a little bit later on next week in detail. All right, here we go. And da, 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 da. a lot of going. To, see, here's the thing. All right, right over here. This is the number of days to reaction. So most people, they get a reaction immediately, obviously. And then you start seeing these spikes, seven days, 10 days, 28 days. And, you know, this is not in numerical order. This is in, you know, this is the number of reactions being reported so many days out. So when you go from here to here, uh, that intrigues me. And say, so why is it taking 28 days from uh, inoculation to uh, reaction, uh, or at least to be reported? So, and that's not insignificant number right there. So I'm just, cu I'm just curious. So that's why I want to delve into the database a little more in detail. Um, this is basically um, narcolepsy. Remember when last week and hyperpsomnia? There seems to be some energy balance issues going on. And so I started one, if you read here, uh, any of these, uh, these are all different case reports. Uh, spontaneous, you know, uh, it's like, you can see this being reported by either healthcare workers or other healthcare workers. Uh, yeah, th these are scary reports. These are, the, if you read through these and every single one is like, is like horrifying. And, uh, you know, it's, it just, you got to read through it to understand it, but to proceed forward. I mean, I get stuck reading uh, uh, reading through it as well, uh, but to proceed as follows. All right, vaccine reaction report of interest submitted to VARES. And uh, let's go more detail right here. All right, so let's look at that. Reports submitted per condition. You may notice a little bit less uh, numerically. Again, as I said before, I, I went through a lot of the database and tried to clean up the dirty data. And so, here we have this. Now, what I also did here, as far as benefit, as far as these are the reports, Bell's palsy, paralysis, uh, mortality, shingles, COVID, and fatigue. This is really, this is my part of my concern. Between here and here, hypersomnia and fatigue, uh, um, it just, there's, again, there's some safety signals in reference to something, uh, but to proceed as follows. Now look at age, another way of looking at it. Now look at age. You see the uh, this is the average age when these symptoms or these 
the average age of the individual submitted these reports to Veras. And what's done here, just for the data analyst, and it, it's a pretty wide swath, but if you look at here using SciPy importing stats, I trim the mean. I did 20% off each side. It may be a little higher. Look at standard deviation, whatever it is, but I don't want to bore the audience in reference to that. But, you know, I got to get rid of the outliers. You know what I mean? And so the myocarditis you see is there. Hypersomnia is interesting. And fatigue, uh, mortality uh, is being submitted to VARES. You see that it's 76.82. So you can, you can get an idea of the age in each condition being reported to the um, uh, in reference to that. So you, you, it's it's intriguing. But this one, even though it's very low on the radar, um, is interesting. And so I think some, something's up there with that. All right, let's go to the other data as follows. Let's go to the COVID rebuild. Do, do, do. And this is looking at our states. Uh, as we said before, this is the, the average age of mortality. And we looked at, all right, and we're just going to scroll down. I want to go down to basically pass all this. I want to get to some sort of uh, plotly data frame or, or plot the plot, pandas data frame, a plotly graph that can combine a lot, make it easier to see. Um, but let's look at the data here. This is our mortality. This is how it, the trend appears to be going. Let's see if we can make this a little smaller to get it all in play. Let's see if that works. There. And now you can see. And see the mortality, deaths per 100,000 back in April 16th, 2020 was 2.99. And with all of our advances in medicine, and everything else like that, our mortality now coming up to November 4th, the last report here, is 2.98. Is that demoralizing or what? 2.99 to 2.98. Proceed forward. And then Florida. Check this out. You ready for this? Now here's Florida. Remember, Florida was going to fall off the face of the earth. I go through this every week. Uh, no, no lockdowns, no masking, and everything else. Like that California, New York, are maniacal. In Texas, we know it's got its own issues. But look at the look at the, the continuous pattern: spike down, spike down. Uh, very, very rarely do you get this curve. You always get this spike. And here we go. How is Florida now doing compared to California, New York? Let us see what's going on here. Ba -ba -ba. This will probably lead into DeSantis's future run for president or vice president. There we go. Florida, as of November 4th, 0.116 mortality per 100,000, smooth, compared to California. All right, then look at this. All right, 0 0.11, 0 0.88. So what do you say that California is eight times worse than Florida, New York? Well, who's even keeping score anymore? 0.94. So all this pandemic mitigation, all this lockdown, all the school closures, all this vaccine mandates and everything else that being incorporated by these states, when looking at it from an observational standpoint, does it mean observation is not causation? Who knows? Florida could have some magic out there, which is which no one sees that could be conflating the figures uh, ultimately low that somehow they've developed some sort of a effective strategy of basically just not paying that much attention to it. But who knows? Florida has outperformed them all. Every newspaper article, every fear mongering, every uncertainty being weaponized to terrify people, to stay away from Florida, even people telling people not to fly to Florida. Again, I digress. There it is. And again, you know, that's just that's just the numbers. That's just the numbers. But look at that trend, which is interesting because look at this. You have Texas and Florida, which don't really have a lot of lockdowns and mandates. You notice the algorithm or the uh, the pattern. You see that? Now you have California and New York, which have lots of uh, lots of mandates and lockdowns. Uh, they seem to have that January, 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 January that pattern, but they don't have any more spikes. But they tend to have a higher average overall, at least currently. That could change, but right now Florida's kicking butt on California, New York, and we can't even find our governor in California right now. He's been missing for the past 10 days, it seems like. All right, and there's the data on reference to that. Mutations, here we go. Ba -ba -ba. Mutations, if it comes in there, come on, turn the page. Any day now, come on, any second. One second. 
two, three, four. There it goes. Sorry about that. All right, that was terrifying for a second. I know, and they're actually still terrifying because it's still not moving up. There it goes. All right, one second, one second. I'm gonna pause this for a second just to get the time to catch up. All right, I just sped it up a little bit so we can get to the section because it was like getting choppy on the computer. Right, here we are, I'm back. Total cases per million. Now keep in mind, for those not familiar, what we're looking at is this is the vaccinated, the amount of individuals fully vaccinated per 100. And so, for example, here you have the number 71 to 100. So what we're trying to do is look at observational data that supports the use of mass vaccination, whether it's making a difference or not. And it's weak. It's not really a study. We're eyeballing it. But however, though, the data is so, um, not, oh, wow, not in favor of basically when we look at it, you know, uh, you know, straight, that if you had to look at this data, not knowing anything else, not knowing any of the correlations or causative information, your argument for mandatory vaccination wouldn't be very strong based upon this observational data. Total cases per million, 81,515, and those which are vaccinated, 71, 71 to 100, fully vaccinated. Those not fully vaccinated, zero to 10, or I should say low vaccine countries, where only less than 10 per 100 are vaccinated and have a human development index of 0.6 and a population of 5 million or more. And there's that, 11 to 20. All right, so does the case for vaccination win uh, overall in total cases per million, even though those, those infections may be less severe? I don't know, you tell me. Reproduction rate, all right, reproduction rate, 0 0.82, 0 0.81, 0 0.94. Who has the highest Reproduction rate, which is not a good thing, uh, in reference to basically, um, well, COVID, 71 to 100, 1.13. Uh, yeah, that's not a good argument for the fully vaccinated per 100. New cases smooth per million. Wow. All right. We're above the index here, both the 40 to 49 and the uh, uh, two. Well, look at that. New cases smooth million, which explains the reproduction rate is highest among those those countries most vaccinated. Deaths per million, not as much, but still the ones which are barely vaccinated, zero to 10 per 100. Um, yeah, I, I don't see a really compelling argument. The 60 to 70 is, is less than 71 to 100. So that gives you an idea of the countries. These are the countries, all right? Now if we look at it here, Let's look at this. Let's make it a little bit bigger again. Let's just see. So you can see a little easier. Da, 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 0.9. I think maybe that's good. Let's see. Yeah, that should be good. All right. So here is our countries. A uh, little bit of a scatter plot here. All right. Now we're looking for is correlations. New cases smooth per million versus people fully vaccinated per 100. All right. And so... These guys are a little on the lower end, but here in these countries, for example, if we look at right here, which are not as vaccinated as here, so these guys have more cases. So we look at uh, right here. Let's see. Yeah, these are all the countries, for example, look at the cases smooth per million. And they're all down basically in the bottom axis here. All these countries, for example, if we reset, if we could find all these countries, are they doing better than there's United Kingdom? Let's see, then there's United States. There's United States at cases smooth per million. And we go back down to United Kingdom. And there's United Kingdom, and people fully vaccinated, almost at the 70, but look at the cases per million. Not seeing a really big herd immunity thing going on there, you know what I mean? And that's just the way it looks. And let's get that done. There's that. So again, cases smooth per million, uh, and then people fully vaccinated. Now we're gonna change our axis a little bit. Now we're telling the total boosters per 100, because now this is a new thing to find, and new cases smooth per million. All right, let's look right here. Real fast. So 
this way you get through the clutter here. Let's look right here again. If anything, whoops, wrong thing there. Well, I'll just move it up like that. You can see it that way. And so you can see, damn, well, whatever just happened. Let's reset that. You can get the point as far as uh, there's not necessarily at this point in time a lot of tremendous correlation uh, to what's going on in reference to whether the boosters are actually making a difference or not. Uh, again, this is, for example, Israel. If we take this right here, so let's we'll see how Israel's doing compared to other countries that are not doing what uh, the boosters as much. So there you are, Israel. And look at all the other countries that barely have any boosters have less cases per million than Israel. All right, let's reset that. Let's keep it going. Uh, boosters per 100 population to new deaths. Here we are again. And again, this is total boosters, so I'll bring Israel to the play. Let's see if we have a reduction in mortality. So we got here, there's Israel. Uh, total boosters. Yeah, Israel's got a little bit less mortality. Uh, I don't know where China gets its reporting from. Let's just keep on going down here. All right, there's Israel. Uh, the most, but look at all these countries which have lower mortality than basically, you know, like even Hong Kong. Look, the, no, barely any boosters. Bangladesh. Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Ecuador, Nepal, Dominican Republic, India, and they're all doing better than Israel, which has a higher booster rate. You can see where the total boosters per 100, 45.23, uh, which is really high. But new deaths boost per million, 0.439. Uh, India, 0.259. Ecuador, 0.2. Uh, Hong Kong, nobody, pretty or at least below zero. And there is the number of people vaccinated per 100. I mean, Portugal, United Arab Emirates, way up there. And that leads into our next chart, for example. All right, let's look at this. Fully vaccinated per 100. Let's give you a good idea. See, there's your Portugal. All right, total deaths per million. Again, we're looking for patterns. Looks pretty balanced right there, except for Peru. Reproduction rate. And we saw before the place that had the most vaccinations tend to have a higher reproduction rate, cases per million. See new cases smooth per million. I look, you see what I mean? It just again, I'm looking for any sort of visual correlation into the efficacy of mass vaccination at this point in time with these particular variants. I'm not. And you can make the argument for or against. I mean, but if you're only going to look at the United States, you're going to say how things are working, but you're not going to look at the rest of the globe. And that lacks a high level of situational awareness, and I'm not into that. But to proceed, now web scraping. Ba -ba -ba. All right, here we go. This is the VAERS. Let's look at this. This is, let's look at this one. All right. The VAERS file size, the zip file size, all right, compared to all of the past 30 years, 122.53 megabytes. Uh, the file size from just January 2021 to today, 2021, 150.49. We now have basically, we are 27.96 megabytes larger of all of reports to VAERS this year as compared to the prior 30 years reporting. That percentage is as follows, 22.82% greater in the prior three decades. And again, if we want to go back to here again, each year, to give you a comparison, this is 2021 compared to 2022, 2019, so on and so forth down the line. And that just gives you an idea. Uh, just tremendous difference in the various file size. For those that don't believe it, uh, to show you real fast, give you an idea. Just pull this number right here, 2021. Zip files 150.49 megabytes. Compare your files all the way down the line. Add them all up, and they're not going to be as large, anywhere near as large as just the data from 2021 alone. And that's my biggest concern is the staffing to basically go through all these adverse event reports and be able to pull out those safety signals. And then European. We look at a durability uh, vigilance right now. And let's just basically see if there's anything at the top real fast. 
let's just see. Ah, all right. This is what they have. Right, yeah, let's get this. This is the serious uh, reports uh, to your Dura, vid your Dura Vigilance. 537,288, which is about – serious to them means requires hospitalization. So that's about half. So about a half of the 1,144,161 people being uh, reports uh, to VAERS. About 50% of it uh, requires medical attention, just to, uh, to give you an idea. Again, it has to be validated, uh, so on and so forth. Same disclaimers with VARES, with Duravigilance. Oh, I said VARES. Uh, to a Duravigilance, the European database. All right. Again, this number is going to be conflated. So because you could have two fatal designations to one symptom. So let's not pay too much attention to that right off the bat. All right. And now let's go back down there. We'll give the word cloud, pass by, pass by for the expediency and time. Serious reports, uh, joint pain. See, they're different. Uh, a lot of joint pain, chills, headache, COVID, fatigue, fatigue, fatigue. That's both the same thing. Uh, so this should be right up about here. And I don't see any sleep disorders as of yet, but I like to look at their database as well to see if anything, malaise, auxiliary pain, uh, that I don't know, uh, but you get an idea as far as what their serious re reports are as follows. But that's endure vigilance, and that if you want to, just a heads up, you go to here, and you can find all the information that you want in reference to all the uh, adverse event reports as follows. All right, and I think let's go a little further into our data. Da -da -da, I think we're about done. Let's go. Yeah. These you may see before. I was going to do Twitter analysis, but the problem with that is with Twitter censoring all of the people that disagreed with what, you know, who had questions in reference to vaccine adverse event reports and so on and so forth, that I don't no longer, you no longer have an honest sentiment analysis. Data is gold to the world. All right. And Twitter was a gold line for data. But when Facebook and Twitter started censoring people and excluding large, uh, swatches of the entire population, then Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and everything else no longer became pertinent uh, venues in order to basically gauge sentiment analysis of a population because it became echo chambers. That's why censoring is great, you know, for whatever reason they claim, but the impact of data analysis devalues. Uh, Twitter and Facebook as far as running into sort of sentiment analysis. So it's just, it's just, I lost heart in Twitter uh, in reference to getting accurate sentiment analysis. And a lot of researchers are doing the same thing. They can't, if Twitter included the entire population, great. Then you have a fair ability to gauge uh, population sentiment. But since Twitter isolated everyone they saw of certain views it did not uh, aspire to, then Twitter is no longer, or Facebook, the, most of your multimedia is out there is no longer a valid tool for sentiment analysis because once censorship kicks in, you no longer get an honest uh, purview of the entire population. All right, and so let's look at our data as follows. Ba -ba -ba, do the close out. And it is now 1237 at November 7th. And what do we look at today? Going backwards. Uh, people like their secrecy and people don't want to know how much a vaccine costs and they're not willing to tell anybody, which really builds my confidence. Good. Social isolation. Yeah, uh, I know a lot of individuals in long-term long -term care facilities and nursing homes uh, that have been isolated for a long period of time here in California. It's kind of like ironic. First, they send the sick to the nursing homes, which is the most vulnerable, and then they tell you you're trying to protect people by isolating them. Uh, no, the, the lack of mental stimulation alone is hard to watch. I mean, exchanging uncertainties for certainties, you know, you could be afraid of everything, but one thing is certain, social isolation for a lot of these people passing away alone without family contact or anything like that, uh, unforgivable. All right, next after that, uh, virtual schooling uh, was a case of utility, basically what's it coming up with. Um, Vaccine-induced immunity, how the vaccine works, we're still discovering. Uh, do you really want to mandate a vaccine that no one knows exactly how it works? Yeah. Uh, that kind of answers the question in one fell swoop. Uh, your pets, 
it could get kind of complicated. Age, females are prone to cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, at least from this type of vector vaccine, uh, right there. Johnson & Johnson or Janssen & Janssen, depending on the alias. Wonderful article from British Medical Journal. Try to see it from both sides, but unfortunately, as you, as you delve into the data, uh, the numerical data uh, gives you an interesting perspective, which a lot of school boards should be paying attention to. A lot of parents that basically have communication still of uh, basically fluid with that school board itself. This is a really, I like the British Medical Journal. It's just saying, it, just, it gave the data, it gave the risk factors, and allows you to make the decision. All right, immune response validates the information in reference to immunoglobulin A, immunoglobulin G, from the lactoferrin reference to this research article here, uh, which basically re confirms lactoferrin, uh, bovine, goat may work as well. But again, the study was studied in humans and lactoferrin I think is gonna be a real solid rising star. When we did our first report on lactoferrin a few weeks ago, lactoferrin began to fly off the shelves in various markets. Uh, but, but if it's as promising, it is what you're looking at right here uh, this definitely needs uh, priority research because it's being validated over and over and over again. And if inoculation is iffy, but lactoferrin is not, then why not? Again, signing off, gratitude, thank you. It is now 12.41 a.m. and I'm just doing long goodbye again. But as always, if you listen this long, I appreciate it. And all of that will be there for you as well. Once it renders to 4K, sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but once it renders to 4K, then I'll bookmark it or chapter the, the thing so you can go to the right to that information you're looking for right off the bat in the video. And I'll be there for you. If if, if not, you don't want to watch the video, uh, I'll have the links there in the YouTube section up and running right from the start to get-go. Uh, so you can look delve into the information on your own. And I look forward to see you all once again next week. I am humbled by you watching. Gratitude to the great research. And I will be seeing you all very shortly once again in spirit, I should say, whatever. And maybe my computer will run a little faster and so on and so forth. All right, catch you all next time. There's that. I want to leave it at that. That's the average age, 0 to 17, 576. And what do we learn? that only 41% of those poor souls may be just directly to COVID-19, all right? So that number right there in 576 from 017 reported via the CDC during the entire pandemic is what the big argument is right about now. And so there is the data, it's there. If you can find a way to uh, scrape it from the CDC database, which makes it almost impossible to do, go for it. If not, I'll have it here and I'll have a link for you to follow on your own and display it to whoever your policymakers are if you're not the policymaker yourself. All right, guys, catch you all, guys and gals, catch you or others. I want to include everybody yeah, or everything. I'll catch you guys all, all these later on. See you then. Bye, 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 bye.